So here in chapter 6.4, we are going to talk about viroids, virusoids, and prions. <clears throat> so the reason that they are in chapter 6 here with viruses is that they are quite similar to viruses in that they are non-living. So they are non-living disease agents. So they do cause a type of disease, uh, depending on the ones that we're talking about. So dis-ease, uh, meaning problems and what they infect. Um, but they are still non-living, so similar to viruses that are non-living. Um, in this case, when we're talking about viroids, virusoids, and prions, what we're talking about are particles of RNA only or proteins. So particles of RNA only or protein only that self-propagate self-propagate to the expense of a host to the expense of a host so that's why these are very interesting so let's start with uh, viroids so viroids are made of only a short circular RNA so that is it, made of only a short circular RNA, and it is capable of self-replication. It does not have a protein coat, so it is not a virus. It is not like a virus where we have the nucleic acid in the inside and then a protein coat. So a virus can be very simple, meaning just nucleic acid and protein coat, including just RNA and a protein coat. Um, but this does not have a protein coat. It literally is just a short band of circular RNA. Um, so we see this oftentimes in plants. There's a lot of agriculture that has been affected by viroids. Um, and this is typically spread mechanically. Um, so typically, whoops, dispersed mechanically. So what they mention specifically is if a knife gets a viroid on it and then you cut, um, for example, they saw it with cutting potatoes, um, um, a knife had a viroid on it and then potatoes were cut with that viroid and then those potatoes were planted for a crop and that viroid, that just teeny tiny piece of RNA, was able to make copies of itself. And then it caused kind of these little lumpy tumor type things on the potatoes, for example, um, and started causing problems with it. And they saw it in all sorts of different types of uh, vegetation. So in, in tomatoes and um, in those potatoes and avocados and peaches and, and other types of um, vegetation. So uh, dispersed mechanically. Maybe even uh, vegetative reproduction or in vegetative reproduction. So when they're cutting a potato to make it into smaller pieces to plant. Um, and then maybe even within the seeds or insects. So actually insects mechanically moving it to another location. And then that little tiny RNA can make copies of itself and then start to cause problems inside of the uh, vegetation, inside of the plant. Um, so <clears throat> that is a viroid. Uh, next, what we're going to talk about are virusoids. A virusoid is a non-self-replicating single-stranded RNA. So it's non-self-replicating in the fact that it just can't make copies of itself like a viroid can. Um, but what it does is it requires the ribosome. So it has ribosomal activity. So once it encounters a ribosome, then it can use that ribosome to make many, many copies of itself. Um, but it, it can't make copies on its own. The thing is, is that it requires a helper virus. <coughs> So requires a helper virus to get into the cell. 
So the way that this works, the way that a virusoid works, is that it has to basically hitch a ride. It hitches a ride with a helper virus. Once that helper virus and the virusoid within that helper virus, because it's just hitching a ride, gets inside of the cell, then it basically just does its own thing. It has nothing to do with that helper virus once it gets inside the cell. So the virusoid just gets to a ribosome, takes over, and, and just starts making lots of copies of itself at the ribosome. And then it can it just allows the helper virus to do whatever it does, depending on the type of virus it is, but then it needs to hitch a ride to the next cell. So it needs to be um, within a virus to get into the next cell, and then it just separates itself and does its own thing. So virusoids basically hitch a ride with the helper virus, and then it replicates independent of the virus. So it replicates independent of the virus. And it does not code for protein. It does not code for, I want to say A protein, A protein or proteins. Um, it is just a single stranded RNA. So it makes lots of copies of its single stranded RNA, and then it's just single stranded RNA. And it can cause problems as well. Um, when we talk about virusoids, we're talking about plants, but we also have something that's similar to virusoids in humans or in eukaryotic cells. And those have been termed satellite RNAs. <clears throat> so satellite RNAs are pathogenic RNAs found in animals. So these also require a helper virus. So require a helper virus to co-infect and replicate. So it needs to get into the cell using this helper virus. But in this case, satellite RNAs may encode for proteins. So may encode for proteins. And in this case, when we're talking about animals, what we have found is that when we have this co-infection with the helper virus and the satellite RNA, that this actually tends to make whatever the disease is or the symptoms of the disease worse. Uh, so the example that the text gives is the hepatitis delta virus. So hepatitis delta, whoops, delta virus, or kind of like a, whoops, virusoid. Um, you know, they're determining the name here because um, it's not actually a virus, right? It's just a single-stranded RNA. So it was called a virus at the time because they didn't know what they were getting into, but now it's a virusoid, but is actually a satellite RNA. Um, so <clears throat> it is a satellite RNA that infects with hepatitis B. And so then what it with the hepatitis B virus. So again, the hepatitis B, B virus is the helper virus, and then that hepatitis delta virus, which is actually a virusoid or a satellite RNA, is hitching a ride with that, and then it actually makes uh, the symptoms much worse compared to the hepatitis B. Um, having the hepatitis B and, he and hepatitis D virus um, actually makes the symptoms much more much worse. All right, so the last one that we are going to talk about in this section is called the prion, or our prions. And prions are proteinaceous infectious particles. <clears throat> um, so we mentioned at the beginning of this section that we were talking about particles of RNA only, which were the viroids, which are just that small circular RNA, and virusoids, which were non-self-replicating single-stranded RNA. And then we also said it could be or protein only that self-propagate. So prions are the protein only. So these are proteinaceous, infectious particles. Um, and so what prions are, they are misfolded rogue proteins. A misfolded rogue form, we'll say here, rogue form of a normal protein found in a cell. So this misfolded rogue form, they say is PRPSC, 
And then the normal protein is the PRPC, just for shorthand. So basically what we're talking about here is that we have a normal protein that we find in our cell, uh, just a typical protein that our body codes for that's normal, it's supposed to be there, and then either spontaneously it misfolds or because of a genetic mutation it is misfolded. Then when this misfolding happens, it ends up being infectious, meaning that when that um, rogue form happens, this mo misfolded rogue form of a normal protein happens, and it touches another normal protein found in the cell, that same type of protein, then it will actually cause that one to misfold, and then the next one touches the next one, it causes that to misfold, and so it causes all these other proteins in the area to misfold, and then it causes plaques in that particular tissue. So this uh, misfolding may be caused uh, spontaneously or a genetic mutation. And then it can be infectious, which means that it causes other proteins to misfold. And then this causing these other proteins to misfold actually creates or causes plaques, which are basically um, just chunks of these misfolded proteins because it's no longer the correct tissues. Um, we're, we're misfolding protein, misfolding protein, all of these proteins, and then it starts to kill those cells because it's just filled with misfolded proteins. And then those misfolded proteins bump into the other cells and then cause those proteins to misfold. And so then it just causes kind of this chain reaction of misfolding of proteins. And then when these proteins are misfolded, then they no longer function the way they're supposed to. And then those cells get filled with proteins that are no longer functioning the way they're supposed to. And then the cell will die off. And then those proteins will be available to touch other proteins. So then it causes these plaques, these kind of spaces of tissue that no longer have cells in them, but are just filled with these misfolded proteins. Um, this can be extremely dangerous because what we're talking about here is that what they're causing are called transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. So transmissible spongiform encephalopathy or TSEs. Those are the types of diseases, um, that's the name of the diseases, <clears throat> that come from prions that, cause, that are caused by these misfolding of proteins. Um, so these transmissible spongiform encephalopathies or encephalo encephalopathy um, are the types of diseases caused by this. So this can be seen in both humans and animals, uh, other animals, so in humans and other animals. And you may actually be familiar with this um, and maybe don't even know it. So we can see these in other animals in the form of diseases called mad cow disease, for example. So mad cow disease is kind of the, the layman's term for the TSE that was found in cows. Um, we see scrapie, if you've heard of scrapie, and we see that in sheep and uh, sheep and goats, and chronic wasting disease, you might have heard of that, chronic wasting disease, which we find in elk and deer. So these are all TSEs, um, and what this means, encephalopathy, is related to the brain. <clears throat> and so what happens is um, these prions, typically the way that we get them is um, this spontaneous folding is due to eating contaminated meat. Eating contaminated meat. Or contaminated animal feed. Or, of course, genetics. So eating contaminated meat. And I, I think that most people have heard of mad cow disease because of it being contaminated meat <clears throat> and then that getting to humans. 
Um, so it is not transmitted via casual contact. Let me write that down now. So not transmitted, move this up, via contact, casual contact. Um, so contact in the in the way that you eat the meat and then you can get it, but not casual as in like, you know, hugging or holding hands or, you know, um, interacting in any sort of superficial way. So, so you may have heard of mad cow disease. That is because the cows themselves had mad cow disease, um, which is a TSC that's found in cows. And then humans were eating that contaminated meat. And so then they were getting a TSC. Um, and people still called that mad cow disease, but it's called different things in humans. Um, so in humans, what we actually, the, the majority of them are called Creutzfeldt jakob disease. So Creutzfeldt jakob uh, CJD disease. So Creutzfeldt jakob disease. And there are different types of Creutzfeldt jakob diseases. Um, so there are genetic forms of it, so passed down through genetics, but mostly what we see is from eating contaminated meat. And there isn't really a way to know if meat is contaminated, except if we get to the point of the animal acting um, strangely due to these plaques that are formed. So let me back up a moment. Uh, prions <clears throat> are these misfolded um, vogue rogue, rather, rogue um, proteins. And so then, again, when it touches another protein, it, it misfolds. These prions tend to be in the nervous tissue. So we're talking about the brain. So when we're talking about mad cow disease, scrapie, chronic wasting disease, the human ones with creutzfeldt jakob Kuru, uh, fatal familial insomnia, um, all these different TSEs are related to the brain and the spinal cord, the nervous system. And so when somebody eats contaminated meat that has one of these misfolded proteins in it, it will go to the brain and it will cause more misfolding of proteins. Every time it touches another one, it will misfold that protein. And so then what happens, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's causing all of these misfolding of proteins and then it kills the cell and then it continues to misfold proteins and it creates these plaques in the brain. If you can imagine, if you are replacing your brain cells many, many brain cells over and over and over again, just with this rogue misfolded protein causing other misfolded proteins, that's not a good thing. Um, and it always and eventually ends in death because it, it just continues to spread <clears throat> through the nervous system, through the brain, eventually killing whatever organism it's in. So if we're talking about mad cow disease, we're talking about it being in the brain of the cow, and then it creates these plaques, and then the cow um, eventually behaves very erratically, very strangely, because its brain is basically being eaten away by these misfolded proteins. Um, and so then that cow has mad cow disease, as it's called, <clears throat> the TSE. Um, and then what happened with uh, mad cow disease many years ago now is that um, this misfolding happened in some cows that were slaughtered and then turned into meat for human consumption. And then humans were eating it. And so then humans were getting these TSEs, the creutzfeldt jakob disease, and then humans were dying because they had eaten this contaminated meat because the, um, the hamburger meat, the, the ground beef, was contaminated with the cow brain that had the prions in it. <coughs> We also see this in scrapie. So if um, in the past when a sheep or a goat was behaving erratically or strangely, um, people would identify that as scrapie, and then they would typically they would kill the animal um, and then not use its meat. Uh, same thing with chronic wasting disease. So that can be a problem if people are out there hunting elk or deer, and then they bring that home and they perhaps um, take care of the animal itself and turn it into meat for their family or others and then it is contaminated with the prions. And then it can get into the human if that human eats contaminated meat, and then it can go to the brain and cause this TSE in the human, which eventually kills the human. Now the problem with this is it is resistant to heat, chemicals, and even radiation. 
Basically, we have absolutely no way whatsoever to get rid of it. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter if you cook this contaminated meat until it is burnt and black. Uh, if you still touch it, eat it, um, then you'll still get the disease. So it doesn't matter how much you heat it. It doesn't matter how many chemicals you apply to it or how much radiation you apply to it. The protein stays there. It stays rogue and it stays infectious. Um, so um, any time, and it also can move, obviously, as I've already mentioned, from other animals to humans. Um, so through eating contaminated meat, but then also other animals eating the contaminated meat of other animals or the contaminated animal feed. Um, so if an animal has died because of the TSE um, and then they were near the food or, you know, the cow is eating the, uh, the grass near the dead cow because of a TSE and that protein, you know, somehow is out on the grass that they're eating, um, then that can be passed along to the other cow. Um, so just a last note on this, I did mention the Creutzfeldt jakob disease, which is the most common one, but some other examples are Kuru. Uh, Kuru was found a notice from uh, cannibalism, so from humans eating other humans, they were getting this uh, TSE and causing death that way. Also, fatal familial insomnia, and the longest one, Gerstmann, Straussler, Schenker disease. Oops, disease. <clears throat> um, so these are all different TSEs that can occur in humans. So the ones I mentioned up here, the mad cow disease, scraping, chronic wasting disease are the ones in other animals. Um, and then the ones that I mentioned down here are in humans. And so some of these are the genetic ones. So the mutation like this one, also called GSS here at the end, this is a genetic mutation here. And the familial uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob is also a genetic mutation. Whereas Kuru is from eating infected meat because of, uh, because of cannibalism. Um, so and other Creutzfeldt-Jakob, the variant C CJD, is from eating contaminated meat from cows and sheep and goats and elk and deer. Um, so it can be genetic. Most often it's due to eating contaminated meat, however. And again, you cannot get rid of it or kill it. So it can be very dangerous. All right. So uh, that wraps up this chapter and wraps up our study of viruses as well as other non-living disease agents as we just talked about here. <clears throat> so our three non-living um, disease agents that we talked about are our virusoids, or viroids, virusoids, and prions. Remember that viroids are only the short circular RNA and they are capable of self-replication. So they don't need anything, they're just all by themselves and they can replicate and cause problems, cause disease. Virusoids are not self-replicating. They require a ribosome to replicate, but they just make more copies of themselves. Um, the single-stranded RNA, um, and then it requires a helper virus to get into the cell. Uh, so you, it hitches a ride on the helper virus, gets into the cell, and it has ribosomal activity. It makes the single-stranded RNA. In humans or in animals, um, those would be called satellite RNAs. And then lastly, we talked about prions, which are not RNA, but they're proteins. And they're just literally a protein that's misfolded. And then that causes more misfolding of proteins, which causes those plaques that we just spoke a lot about. Um, so again, that wraps up our chapter six.